Good morning, everybody. I want to first say, God is great for giving me this second chance to meet with all of you. I'm humbled and I'm thrilled that this is finally working out. I bring you regards from the great city of New York, where I now reside. And I want to thank, first of all, this wonderful, all of you for inviting me, especially John Porteous, Jean Simpson, who has become my second mom. Jean, stand up. You deserve every allocate, accolade that you are giving us. Where's Jean? Jean, Jean, stand up. She's hosting my, um, both of us today, Mariatu and myself, and has been just unbelievable. And certainly John Porteous, who has st stood beside me these two years, I was bothering you, I want to come, I want to come. Finally, I am here. Also, I haven't met yet uh, Terry Fitzgerald, who made our tickets and who has been in touch with me for these last two years. The subject, also I want to send the, uh, give thanks to the clergy here, everybody who has made it possible for this wonderful uh, meeting today and tomorrow and during this whole Eucharistic convention. I'm grateful to all of you. When we speak of the Holocaust, what do we mean by that term? It means complete destruction by fire. A time when 11 million innocent people were slaughtered. There is no better word. Who were those people? Six million were Jews. Hitler had a special hatred against the Jewish people. He didn't even understand that we are not a race, we are a religion. They are black Jews, Chinese Jews, Indian Jews. Michelle Obama has a cousin who's a rabbi in Chicago, and you can watch him pray on YouTube. And of course, who was the most famous Jew of all time? Jesus. Yes? We forget about that sometimes. But who were the five million others? They were Jehovah Witnesses, people with physical, mental difficulties, gypsies, different sexual orientation, also some priests, some Poles. Anybody who was against Hitler had to be killed. And all those 11 million people deserved the right to life and happiness. Among those six million Jewish people were one and a half million children. And those three million children's eyes still haunt me because my story was theirs and theirs was mine. Today, I'm going to speak to you about one of my two miracles in life. The second one, I will speak to you tomorrow. Now let us pack our bags and go on the journey of my life through the first 10 years going through the Holocaust in Europe. Next. I was born in a little village in southwestern Germany called Kippenheim. It is very close to France and Switzerland we had about 2,000 people, and I just found out I was over there. The village is 1,250 years old. Yes, Europe is very old. Among those 2,000 people were 60 Jewish families. The rest was divided among Catholic and Protestant. And we lived very happily together, wall to wall, next house to another. And I was the last Jewish child born in that village. Next. This was our house. We owned the house for about 100 years. And I was born in the room, when you look on the right side, 
Those two windows in that room I was born was my parents' bedroom. And I was born on December 31, 1934. I know you don't have to take out your computers. I am 82 years young. Don't call me old. And there was no hospital in my village, and only a midwife, but my mother had a terrible time, so a doctor was called in. And the doctor already belonged to the Nazi party. He wore the brown uniform, but he still took good care of his Jewish patients. And later on, he did some terrible things with the euthanasia program, killing people with physical, mental difficulties. And he was jailed for many years. And you start to think, is there a Jekyll and Hyde in all of us? That is a question. Next. My father was a textile merchant. We weren't millionaires. We were comfortable. I was an only child. And my papa already had a car. And when my father was courting my mom, he came with this bright, shiny car. And when he proposed to her, of course, she said yes. I don't know, did she marry the car or did she marry my father? <laughs> but anyway, the marriage lasted 54 years until my father, my beloved father, died. It was a very good marriage, a happy marriage. Next. My father was a soldier in World War I. We were very proud German citizens, like you are proud of New Zealand. I'm proud to be an American citizen now. And he fought valiantly and was wounded in his right shoulder and received the Iron Cross. Now, in America, we call that a Purple Heart. I don't know what you call it in New Zealand, but it was a high honor in Germany and he was proud to serve. Now, my great-grandmother had 14 children. She had four sons in World War I, and two died for Germany. Very patriotic, and later on, they killed some of the others. Next. And by the way, I was only a citizen for about six months of my life, when it was taken away from me. I was then stateless. I am very proud now to have my citizenship in America. That gave me life and a way to live and happiness. I could get my German citizenship back, but at this point, I really don't need it. I am proud to be in the country that gave me life again. Here I am in my sandbox, already dreaming, perhaps, of becoming a famous scientist. Well, I didn't become famous, but I did become a scientist for many years, 38 years. I worked in medical research and clinical work. And here I'm probably dreaming already of Mary Curie or maybe even Albert Einstein. Next. Very seriously making mud pies. Very serious. An outing to the Black Forest, which was very nearby. It's a beautiful area where I was born. And I'm wearing the traditional German dress, the dirndl dress. When you go into a German restaurant, you see many of the waitresses wearing those nice puffy sleeved outfits and, and the aprons. And I also got a very popular German name, Inga. In my age, in the 30s, almost every girl had the name either Inga, Ingrid, Ingeborg. And when I speak in Germany, I do speak a great deal in Germany. They, uh, I ask the children, do you have a grandma or great-grandma whose name is Ingrid or Ingeborg, Inga? Oh yeah, the hands go up. So it was a very famous name at that time. And my parents wanted me to blend in, to be a real, patriotic German girl. Next. Here's my favorite place or play, and it has a story. In the house where I was born, there was also a tailor born in the same house. He went to England and was taken in by a German tailor shop.
And that tailor shop in London became one of the most famous ateliers of, for fancy men's clothing. And he would make all the uniforms for the guards and, and all the, uh, you know, from, for the queen, the, uh, like the, the hats, the beaver hats, all these was made in, in that tailor shop. And he became very famous. And he came back to Germany and gave uh, money and bread to the poor on his name day. And he built even a hospital, uh, which was not in use anymore, and an orphanage in the Black Forest. He was a good man, a kind man. And to honor him, they uh, placed uh, this little tower and that was my favorite place. And also, they put a plaque on the house that this is the birth house of Georg Stolz von Ottenberg. They knighted him. Today, there's a plaque right next to his that I also was born in this house. And I'm very proud to be born in a house with good karma. A good person was born in that house. Next. The time is now 1938, when everything changed. It was the beginning of the Holocaust. And up to now, we were happy living together. We never wanted to leave the country. My father always said, that crazy guy, Hitler, he will go away. The Germans are too intelligent for that, to follow a man like that. And he really didn't try to leave the country until it was much too late. And 1938 is the part which makes the line between before and after the Holocaust. That is really where it, when it began. My grandparents lived about 200 miles away. And they came to see us quite often. And we went to see them. And um, you can see my parents in the picture and my grandparents. And you see my grandfather has his head covered. Now in the Jewish faith, in the Orthodox uh, division, a man or boy should have his head covered to honor God. I know Christians take off their heads hats to honor God, except the Pope and the Cardinals. They wear also these little beanie uh, caps, and I think you stole that from us. That's okay. We're happy to share. We're happy to share everything. There's something here that is very important. I have my doll, Marlene, in my arms. She would be the only object that would survive my incarceration of three years in the concentration camp. And I gave her some years ago to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, where she is now. And they even made a film about her. We also did. But I spoke quite often, as I told you, in Germany. And one day, a woman uh, saw me with this picture. And she said, you know, you had a famous doll. I said, well, for me, she was uh, very famous. Uh, my grandmother <clears throat> gave it to me when I was two years old. Of course, I couldn't uh, read or write at that time. And I gave her the name Arlene because my mother loved movie stars. <clears throat> and perhaps some of you might remember the name Arlene Dietrich. She was a world famous movie star, blonde hair, blue eyes. That's what my doll looked like. And sort of something like Marilyn Monroe, you know, very sexy looking and, uh, you know, she was quite famous. But this lady told me, your doll's name was Inga, the same as mine. That was the model. And she was made for the 1936 Olympics. That's the Hitler Olympics in Berlin, when our sprinter in America, Jesse Owens, got many awards, and he would not shake hands 
with him because he was a black man and he was so hateful. So this is Inga in the arms of another Inga and we became just about one person. Next. It was the time when we had the first major riot called Crystal Night, the Night of Broken Glass, on November 9th and 10th throughout Germany and Austria, where all the synagogues were either burned to the ground or desecrated very badly. Here, for instance, in our village, it was on November 10th. And you see our beautiful synagogue we call our churches synagogues, and in one day, this picture changed. Next, please. This is what it looked like inside, beautiful chandeliers. And in the Jewish faith, you have a rabbi and a cantor. But the cantor is really more important because most of our uh, prayers are sung, beautiful melodies. You have to have somebody with a beautiful voice. And in our case, we did not have a rabbi, a cantor only, who did both jobs. Next. And this is what happened on November 10th. The, uh, they wanted to burn the synagogue to the ground, but there were Christian houses nearby, and they stopped that. But they desecrated the whole inside of the synagogue. We got that picture a few years ago. Somebody had it hidden in the shoebox up in the attic, and he said, this might be your synagogue, and it was. But what's interesting here is people looking on, the bystanders. I'm always looking for the people, I call them the upstanders, who despite everything will stand up for humanity and help another person. Now here you even see children watching as this beautiful building is desecrated. Next. Now my grandfather went to the synagogue in the morning. Before this desecration, they ripped him from his prayers and sent him to the Dachau concentration camp, the first concentration camp in Germany. All men from the age of 16 were sent to concentration camps during that time, those two days. Terrible uh, riots were taking place. My they, police came to our house and arrested my father, even though he was a disabled war veteran, a patriot from Germany. All the windows in the house, Jewish houses were broken, which we later on had to pay ourselves. I, I remember standing with my mother and grandmother in the living room as one of the hoodlums looked through the broken window, glass all over the place. That's why it's called crystal night, the uh, uh, crystals all over the floor. And at that time, I was not even four years old. It was just before my fourth birthday, but I remember it as clearly as I remember today what's going on today. And one of the hoodlums looked through the broken window and he shouted, look, the chandelier's still hanging. And he threw a rock through the broken window and it almost hit my head. My mother just pulled me away. Then we were hiding in the backyard shed. All the men and boys were gone. Only women and children were left in that village. Now, we had no clue where those men were taken to. Nothing. Now, after a few weeks, uh, they were allowed to come home again. Certainly broken in spirit, in heart because what they went through in Dachau was extremely terrible. They had to give up all their clothing, only wear those blue and white striped prison uniforms, stand in the bitter cold, and if somebody even had to blow their nose, they were hosed down with ice cold water. Happened to my father a few times. And he told them, uh, you know, I, I'm a veteran of, of your country, of our country. He said, oh, you can throw away your iron cross. You mean nothing to us anymore. 
They came home broken hearted. My grandfather died soon afterwards. And it occurred then to my father, we must leave this country. But where? All the doors to the free world were closing. I wish we would have heard about New Zealand. We just thought about Brazil or America, where the doors were closing extremely rapidly. We could have gotten a number which, uh, for America, which would probably let us in maybe 10 years uh, time waiting. Brazil was closing the doors. We had some relatives already there. But we still had hope, because you cannot live without hope. Now, the synagogue looked for many years like this. This was on my first trip back to Europe in 66. And it was used as a storage area for pig food. Jewish people do not eat pork, neither do Muslim people. And it was total desecration. Next. And today it has been rebuilt and it looks the same as before, but you can still see the scars inside. Something happened here. The Ten Commandments, the tablets are on top again, but without any Hebrew lettering, nothing. It is a place that is used today for lectures, not only on Jewish themes or concerts. It's very popular. It sits in the middle of the village and I've spoken there many times. The two most beautiful buildings in Kippenheim uh, are the synagogue, right in the middle of the village, and the city hall. Next. My father and my grandfather came back from Dachau. They couldn't believe what they experienced. Such cruelty. Who could believe it? And my father said, we have to get out, but how? We lived so close to the French and Swiss border, but they were closed, you couldn't get through. Today, you go on a ferry, you're in France, very nearby, near Strasbourg and Basel, very close. So we sold a house at a cheap price, just anything to get out. And we moved in with my, to my grandparents in a little, a smaller village even, about a thousand people. At one time, that village was 40% Jewish because there was a baron who permitted them to settle there more than 200 years ago, and, but they had to live separate. They could not build houses next to Christian houses. Of course, around 1850, most of them went either to America or other uh, towns to improve their lives, except my branch of the family, and they stayed. And I have to tell you, in that village, the people, for the most part, I would say almost all of them were kind to us. My grandparents were the only Jewish family there. And it is possible to be an upstander, to do something and have um, a heart and a conscience to uh, not to, to stand against this terrible hatred. And for the most part, they were not influenced with that. I had many friends there, and even today, I still have friends. Now, in contrast to Kippenheim, where I was born, it was somewhat different. I remember here was my only childhood that I was allowed to have maybe two years of my life. We would walk up and down the street with my friends, my Christian friends, and we sang the songs of the day, which were many times Nazi songs. We didn't even know what we were singing. And I, there's something special I want to point out to you. When you look down that little hill, on the bottom, trust me, you can't see it too closely here, one of those houses was a bakery. And that bakery belonged to Albert Einstein's and an uncle. Now, you know about Albert Einstein, right? When somebody's very smart, you say he's an Einstein. No, I never knew that he had relatives in that village. But he used to come there as a little boy because I wanted to become a scientist, and for me, he was one of my heroes. And we did go once to Princeton, where he lived, but nobody could show us where the house was, and I am 
quite sure he would have invited us because I'm the only child from the uh, state of Württemberg, from the city of Stuttgart, from all the children who survived. I'm the only one. Not only that, I was a nerdy kid. I wanted to be a scientist, a chemist, and he would have invited, he would have been quite happy to meet me. I'm so sorry I never met him. Next. Here was my grandparents' house. Most Jewish people at that time uh, were not allowed to enter uh, jobs like, um, with the, uh, like to become a mason, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the trades. They did not accept them into the unions. So what they did, of course it changed later on, they had little shops with cattle dealing, especially in the little villages. Um, they uh, sold some cows. Now my grandfather was a cattle dealer, small time. He would have two, three cows in the stable, and guess what, where the stable was? In the house. Now you look at the black door on the right. That's where the cows were. And then the other door is where you go upstairs to our apartment. And when I go uh, to the west, uh, of America where you'll have a lot of uh, ranches and things, I tell them, I need to smell those cows again. For me, it is perfume. It brings back memories of my very short childhood. And in this village, the house is still standing. It has been uh, rejuvenated, so to speak, from the outside. It is today the most beautiful building in the whole village. It, it's just wonderful. And I have good relationship with the man who owns it now. Next. Here's my best friend, Elizabeth, my first friend ever, Christian girl. She lived across the street. Her mother was my mother's best friend, and just now, about three weeks ago, she passed away. And the last time I spoke to her was Christmas and she was very depressed, she was very sick. And we were friends till the end. And of course, always my doll Marlene is with me. That became my lifetime friend. Next. My grandfather dies in May of 39, both of a broken heart physically and spiritually after what he experienced in Dachau. He has the only uh, monument in the Jewish cemetery, a lying down stone. The others are wrecked, beautiful, because they were already desecrating Jewish cemeteries, knocking down the monuments, and we didn't want this to happen to my grandfather. And today it is still there, but sunk in the earth quite uh, almost to the top. You see me with my dental dress, I'm bringing flowers to my grandfather. I adored my grandparents. Next. These pictures you're about to see are extremely rare. It is the deportation of the Jewish people from my home state, which began already in 1940. We were still safe in another state, the state of Baden. Um, and you even see members of my family being deported. These pictures were up in the attic somewhere, and they gave it to us not too long ago. You see that little girl standing in front. We ask her, she's still alive today, quite old at this point. What did you think as your friends are being sent away? Well, I just wanted to look. And that is the problem of being a bystander and not doing anything. I didn't expect her to do something, but I certainly expected more of the German people to stand up for their neighbors who were fighting with them in wars. And this family here, for instance, they were like second, third cousins of ours. They did survive uh, through a very convoluted route and they landed up in America. And these people were sent to a camp uh, in the Basque region of France. It's where France and Spain come together. Very far from Kippenheim. Days and days of travel. But the whole state of Baden was Judenrein, meaning free of Jews, in the end of uh, October 1940. We were still safe. Next. They gave them very little time to pack up maybe half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Here's another 
cousin of ours, an old man, he did not make it. He was sent the route from uh, it was from um, Gurus, Kade Gur, to Drancy, Auschwitz. Almost all of them landed and were killed in Auschwitz. Next. Here it's, you see the whole town is watching. You can even see a cow there. It was an agricultural area. Oh, this old woman, also a relative of ours. Oh, we had many relatives in the village. Next. And we know who this man's um, uh, the daughter, we knew his daughter. And from the back, she realized that was the father. He said, oh, it can't be. She didn't want to believe it because he's ha he has a suitcase with a rope around it. He said, my father was an elegant man. He would not travel like this with a rope around his suitcase. But it was he. And he was killed in Auschwitz. Next. The time is now 1941. I'm in a different state. The two states of Baden, Württemberg, are today one. They were arch enemies, but today they have to be one, and it's a very prosperous state. And I'm still safe. 1941, I'm still safe living in the village. I had to go to school, of course. And Jewish children were not allowed to go to the school where they were living. Only one school in the capital of Württemberg. I had to have special travel permission papers uh, to go there in the beginning. My father took me there. Next, this was the uh, school. They had two classes from the whole state. Every child had to go there. Uh, grades one to four and four to eight. Next, please. And then it became even more difficult when we had to wear the yellow star, the yellow badge, which was supposed to make me a terrible person, an ugly person, a coward. The color yellow is always uh, significant with cowardice. In Hebrew, like letters, they wrote the word Yude, Jew. And I have my original star here, what it looked like. You see it up here, but you see it a little closer. You can meet me later and I'll show it to you. They came on a yellow sheet. You had to sew it on over your left side, over your heart. Anybody from the age of six on. And the, it was terrible cloth. My mother put a backing on it that you could sew it on. I ripped that star off on May 8, 1945 when I was liberated from the terrorism concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. Today it's called the Czech Republic. And um, my father told me later on they had to do slave labor. And I went all by myself, by train, six years old, wearing that star. And there were always some kids who would make fun of me you dirty Jew, I was as clean as they. A little girl, six years old, by herself on the train. And my dad said, <clears throat> try to sit in such a way, sit near the window, that you can lean near the window <clears throat> and cover up your star that the people cannot see uh, that you are a Jewish girl. It was greatly in danger. And it wasn't always possible. And I had an incredible uh, situation. One woman, a Christian lady, as she walked out of the car, she put a little brown paper bag next to my seat and walked away. It was probably her lunch. She, and there were some rolls in it. And I never forgot this good lady. There are two heroes of mine in, during that time. Uh, she was one of them. She remained anonymous, no name. I never knew her. But wherever I speak, whether I'm in Mexico, in Brazil, or wherever I am, all over the United States, now I'm in New Zealand, <clears throat> I mentioned this nameless lady who did something. I mean, she did not care whether she's in danger. She was an upstander. She tried to help. She had a conscience. And we all should have conscience for somebody who's hurting uh, in the world, etc. We should help. And I hope she's looking down from heaven and she's smiling and thinking, that little Jewish girl 
never forgot me and I never have even if I didn't know her name she will be one of my heroes I have one other one and that we will hear at the end next this is about what I looked like in those days next please and then the transports to the, uh, to the camps began in 1941 in that part of Germany. School stopped for me after six months. I never finished my first grade. Many others either. I lost eight years schooling in my life. And almost all the children from my sc Jewish school were sent to a place called Riga in Latvia, near Russia. And we got an order for transport in the same transport, my grandmother and my parents and I. And my father wrote to the secret police that he was a disabled war veteran. And could he be, be spared? Somehow, it was a miracle. We were spared from that transport. We had to leave the house uh, for my grandmother. Just took it away. It's no longer yours. Out. Give us the keys. Finish. Done. And we were moved into a slum area in the neighboring town where only Jewish people were allowed to live. And here's a very small example of how many children were killed. Um, these are just a small remnant. Uh, and one, only one of that little group survived. The girl in the striped hat. All these other children were killed. We don't even know where. Somewhere in Poland. Next. Then finally, uh, in August, this was in, uh, in December, a few months later the papers came again and we had to go. There was no other way. It was a directive of six pages. I have my original even with me, a copy of it here with me. What you can take along, no knives, no scissors. Uh, that you couldn't hurt anybody, um, food for about two days, um, and um, a backpack, and a, a blanket, and metal dishes. I was the youngest in a transport of close to 1,200 people. My number would be Roman numeral 13-1. Dash 408. No, we didn't have tattoos in this camp, only in Auschwitz. There were thousands and thousands of other camps. They didn't have tattoos. But that number is tattooed on my heart and soul forever, forever. Next. And I was the youngest. And this is how a transport was put together. We were sent to a school gymnasium. Each of the towns would gather the people to make up a transport of close to 1,200 people. And these pictures are from my first book, I'm a Star, meaning I'm turning this negative symbol, yellow star, into something positive. Because for me, every human being is a star. And they told us, oh, empty everything. And uh, so one of the guards saw, I'm, six, uh, I'm about seven years old at this time, I was wearing a little Dutch boy pin, and he ripped that off me and yelled in the Swabian dialect, Du brauchst das nicht, wo du hingehst, meaning, you won't meet this where you are going. I didn't know where I'm going. And then he saw my doll in my arm. She was a gift for my grandmother. And he ripped her from me. And he looked inside a hollow body if I was carrying anything. Of course I wasn't. And somehow I made a fuss. He gave me back the doll. And that's how I arrived in the cab holding my precious doll. Next. We were sent to the gathering place. These are actual movies made from my grandmother's transport. But we were in the same two rooms when we were gathered. In fact, in the middle, I can't show it to you here, point to it, there is a woman, that was my grandmother's transport, uh, lying there for two days until the trains were ready. There's a woman sort of bowing over who looks exactly like my grandmother. I can't swear to it. It could be the last picture of my beloved Oma. We call Grandma, Granny, Oma in German. Next. Here we're standing to get food in the morning, our metal dishes, waiting for the trains to come. Next. Everybody in Germany had an ID. 
but ours had a J on it. And when we were deported, they put stamped on it, ungesiedelt, resettled, 22nd of August, 1942. You have today many people, uh, the Holocaust deniers, and it's becoming more and more so, say, oh, this never happened, and those ovens in Auschwitz, they bake bread. And I think you would not like the bread from those ovens, a place where over a million people were killed. The ashes are all over. You can just almost smell it still today. Next. So I have actual documentation, and there's certainly enough documentation around this thing did happen. It was not a hoax. We arrived on a passenger train, one of the last, very, very crowded, for about close to three days. We were not allowed to leave the uh, train. The stormtroopers were with us, the SS. And finally, we arrived in a small town called Bauschewitz in Czechoslovakia. And we were told, everybody out, drop everything except your bedroll, a little knapsack, and your metal dishes, and that's it, and march. It was about two mile walk into the camp. We had many old people who couldn't do it, and they were already lying by the wayside, probably dying right there. Next. We are marching in, and they were whipping us. My parents put me between them to try to keep me from the blows. Next marching in, and it didn't happen in the middle of the night, daytime. People saw us. Here, for instance, I got that picture from an archive. People were looking out the window, nobody cared, thinking, what happens to these people? We do not see them anymore. Where do they go? Next. Marching into the camp. Next. And we come to a place called Terezin or Theresienstadt in German, which was actually a little town, a fortress town, built in the late 18th century by Emperor Joseph II in memory of his mother, Maria Theresa. And they took the civilians out of that town and made a concentration camp out of it, surrounded by red brick walls, brick barracks, old rotten houses, and um, just misery, misery. But it was a place where they sent the intelligentsia of Europe, the best musicians, the best doctors, the best lawyers, artists, uh, thinking, well, the world won't miss them, uh, you know, and if they ask, they're all in one place. It was a transit place. You put them there for a while, and then you ship them off to the killing centers like Auschwitz. And if you didn't die there from malnutrition, uh, we had about 140,000 people between 1941 when the camp started to 45. Two thirds would be shipped out like to Auschwitz, uh, other camp, mainly Auschwitz, which was on the route. They even built uh, special tracks that sent them immediately out. Uh, and close to a third died there of malnutrition, uh, typhus, tuberculosis, um, all these terrible diseases. And of course you were in terrible danger to be sent out. Next. Here's one of the buildings, for instance, we were an even bigger one. We landed up in the attic on the barren floor, just a cement floor, no beds, nothing. It was hot and people started to jump out the window, the, the little windows they had. My father even pulled one in. He said, you're not going to do that again. Next morning he did it. We pumped our water from polluted wells. So many people had dysentery, stomach problems, rats, mice, fleas, and bed bugs. Those were our constant companions. Next. He, these are the walls surrounding us, and the guards were marching on them. So children always ask me, why didn't you just jump down? Well, if you did, you would break your bones. Secondly, we had no money. Somebody would, you would have to have to help you on the outside, which would nobody, almost nobody had. There were a few escapes, very few. And the people staying behind got punished for that when somebody escaped. Next. Soon after my arrival, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever. You don't hear too much anymore about that disease. Uh, mainly children get it. 
And of course, I got almost all the children. There was no real hospital, just a few rooms they put together, two children in every bed. My partner was a little girl from Luxembourg and a baby, and that bed was always wet. And our parents were not allowed to see us. And this went on from around September, to just before my eighth birthday uh, in December. I was in there, I could not see my parents, and very little care. Uh, almost nobody took care of us. I mean, there were nurses, but they had no medicine. Of course, you had uh, difficulties too. Uh, you had scarlet fever, then you got uh, measles, mumps, all these other diseases. I was covered with uh, lice. Right? They sh almost shaved my hair off, cut it very short, boils. I was in terrible situation. I lost my voice, but somehow I made it to my eighth birthday. Next. Then we were housed in these rotten, broken down houses. Most men, women, and children uh, had to live separate, but still could see each other. But the disabled war veterans section, the highly decorated war veterans, were able to live together as a family, very bad condition, double and triple deck bunk beds, and those bunk beds weren't nice wood. You could get a splinter, just rough wood, uh, very crowded together in a place like this in the room, maybe have a few thousand living in a place like this. And always the mice, the rats, they, those were our constant companions. I was a very good flea catcher, the best. Next. These, this picture was taken by the Russians who liberated us. They, nobody had a camera. That was all taken away. Everything was taken away from us. But this is how we lived, double and triple deck bunk beds. Next. And pumped our water from polluted wells. Again, after liberation, this was the picture taken by the Russians who liberated us. Next. These little carts brought bread ration. Once a week, you got a little bread. Not good bread, there were all kinds of things in there. And my mother would mark off Monday to Tuesday and then Wednesday. If you went into next day's portion, you had no bread. And food was the most important thing there was. Hunger was a constant companion. These little carts also brought the bodies to the crematory. Over 30,000 people were cremated in Terrasin. Next. Standing on line, again, the Russians took that picture. We had a tremendous typhus epidemic. Uh, even when we were liberated, we could not leave. Three times a day, you stood in line. You had your little uh, metal dish in hand. In the morning, it was a black liquid they called coffee. We used it to clean our clothes. It was like a detergent. Lunch was maybe a little turnip. Uh, maybe a potato, not a good one, and some murky looking soup, and the same thing again at night. Hunger was the most uh, terrible, uh, you know, became almost like a, a friend or enemy, whatever you want to say, it. a companion, day and night. You thought of nothing but eating or making, we children made up stories. One day when we are out, we're going to have the biggest cake with cream as big as of the highest mountain. We were dreaming of food. Next. And what did we children do? The adults had to work. There was some slave labor. They had a mica factory there, a barrack. That's a uh, kind of a stone. The women had to splice it for the war effort. I have a friend who was a little older. She uh, had to sew uh, the holes from the bullet uh, holes from the uh, uniforms they brought in from one of the theaters of, of war. And they had to mend that. I remember a bunch of um, uniforms came in and they had to spray them white for the Russian uh, war effort. But we children, we were good for nothing. What could I do when I'm seven, eight years old? Nothing. So we rummaged around in the garbage dump, trying to find a rotten potato, which could, you could still get a little piece of, a, a potato peeling, uh, a little uh, turnip. The only vegetable I saw during those three years were turnips. No meat, no eggs, nothing, nothing. And believe me, you cannot sustain a good health on food like that. 
So those were our games, finding a little piece of string in a garbage dump. Next. My mother worked in so-called old age room, and she never was a nurse before. I remember going there one day, and all the ladies had sticks in their hands. And I said, what's going on? It turned out the night before, one of them felt something heavy on her shoulder. She looked around. A rat was sitting on her shoulder. The place was filled with vermin. Next. The worst day I remember happened on November 11, 1943. They said a count out had to be taken, and everybody had to leave the camp. The only time I was out of the camp, certainly under guard, and any which time you had at least 40, 50,000 in the camp. And we were herded to this muddy field, surrounded by soldiers and guns pointing at us. It was raining, it was slummy, our feet sunk into the slum. And my mother gave up already, said, they're going to kill us. And believe me, that was the idea. And they were beating us and uh, counting. They knew exactly how many people were there. I mean, Germans are very good with numbers. Somehow, late at night, uh, some order came from Berlin that everybody goes back. I mean, they were ready to shoot because the guns were pointed at us and many people died on the field. And there was a particular really bad SS man. His name was Heindel. They hung him later on, feet up and head down, the Russians did. And he was yelling, men, women, and children, separate. And we didn't want to do that. We were hanging on to each other uh, in, for life. And he took his butt of rifle and beat my mother very badly on that day. That was Heindel. Now, the person who was in charge of the whole liquidation of all the Jews in Europe was Eichmann. Eichmann probably was the biggest killer of all time. He came quite frequently to the camp. Whenever he came, another transport out, another, another. And it was willy-nilly how they you know, got the people together. I saw him very close. I saw Eichmann. There was a big trial in Jerusalem, and very few people get the capital punishment in Israel. He did. And they cremated him and threw him in the water. That was Eichmann. Next. School was absolutely forbidden, but some heroic teachers taught us from memory. My father found a little notebook in the garbage with a few good pages and a little stump of a pe pencil. And I, I, and one woman, a friend of my mother's, knew a little bit of English. I didn't know English. She taught me this poem. I wish I were a little bird up in the bright blue sky that sings and flies just where he will, and no one asks him why. And we wanted to fly away from this dreadful place, and I think my penmanship is pretty good for somebody who only had six months of schooling, six months. And I could read and write and do a little bit of math already. Now the Czech children had it a little bit better than we German kids. They were involved in some drawing pictures. I had none of that. So schooling was just about zero. Next. In 1944, the International Red Cross became interested to see one of these places. They were pushed because rumors abounded, people are being killed. And finally, they decided, we want to see a camp, and my camp was singled out. But not before they made a huge deception they painted some houses with colors and, and uh, you know, some children got uh, some sardine sandwiches and they had to say Uncle Ram. Ram was our last commandant, the head of the camp, SS man. And they ate them down so quickly that they had to replenish. That's the only time they ever got some good food. I was not selected. You had to look still quite good. They had posts up to school, to playground. None of this existed. They even put up a, a soccer game and a children's opera for them to see. And even they printed ghetto money. Uh, like Monopoly money, it was worthless. You could buy maybe some mustard, which made you even more hungry. 
Next. And what they didn't show them was the crematory where over 30,000 people were burnt. I mean, they had died. I think about 33,000. And they went away believing this hoax. And even today, the papers are still there. Yes, what we saw is the children are playing, they're getting sardine sandwiches. Yes, they're, in they're incarcerated, but they can live. And it was a hoax. And they believed that, unfortunately, the International Red Cross, I'm still furious with the Red Cross, furious for not looking further to save our lives. Because once they left, almost the whole camp was sent to Auschwitz. There were selections. My father and my girlfriend's father had to go the same time to the headquarters, the SS headquarters. He was also a disabled war veteran. Not only that, he was half Jewish, the mother totally Jewish, her name was Ruth, my best friend, and she was brought up as a devout Christian. Even in the camp, once in a blue moon, they had a service, you know, underground service, so to speak, Christian service or Jewish one. It was very rare, but she went to those. She folded her hands. She said, our father, uh, who art in heaven, so forth. I learned that, too. And uh, she had sort of a better chance to survive. And I remember when for that name, uh, her father, parents' name was Abraham, ours is Auerbach, AA. So they went the same time, our fathers, for selection. And my father came back, and hers too, and they asked each other, oh, what did you, uh, did you go to the lady with the typewriter? Because my father asked my girlfriend's father, he said, no. He said, well, I went to her, and she put a red circle around our name. And they weren't, and they, as soon as uh, they came back, maybe a week or so later, they were in the transport. We didn't know where those transports went to. And she gave, she had the same doll. She gave me some of her doll's clothing, which I gave to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. But that doll is somewhere in Auschwitz today, her doll. She never made it. She was killed in the gas chamber in Auschwitz before her 10th birthday. And that was my very best friend. Next. Finally, on May 8, 1945, we were liberated by the Russians. And they were burning, uh, the Germans were burning still some of the paper. Uh, the, uh, you could see black piece of paper floating through the air. And I remember I heard a lot of noise. The trucks were moving out and I jumped one of the barricades and I heard a tremendous explosion. They were throwing in hand grenades and one just zipped very close to me and I felt my head. I thought I lost my head. We were then uh, went to a, a dark cellar. My father said, I'm a soldier. We have to run and get some safety. They're throwing hand grenades. They still wanted to kill us. And somehow, about 10 minutes to eight, we were liberated. But one thing I took with me uh, to the cellar, I didn't take my doll. My father found a little prayer book that a soldier might have had. And I took that with me. He threw it in the garbage. And when he was sent away, maybe he lost his faith in God. Or maybe he didn't want to take it. I still have that prayer book. And I never prayed so hard as on that day. We have a prayer that you have like the Our Father. I, we have the prayer called the Shema Yisrael, meaning God is one, one is God. It's a very short when I sing it to you in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echot, God is one, one is God. The whole idea of the uh, idea that you have one God, which was a revelation um, years ago in, uh, by Abraham, really. Next. So finally, the Russians were there, but we had a very bad typhus epidemic. We couldn't go home right away. Here are some of the survivors at the end from the death marches because they wanted to kill every single one. Yet Auschwitz was liberated in January. We were still in prison. 
and gas chambers were ordered at that time, even the beginning of 45. They were just incomplete. Had the war not ended at that time, I would not be standing in front of you, because those gas chambers, they were ready for us. Next. Some years ago, in America, I decided I wanted to go back. Tomorrow I will tell you the story after the war, and I hope you all come. That's my second miracle, surviving uh, the first 10 years. But there's another story for my second uh, miracle of surviving something equally bad. I will talk about that tomorrow. So please all come. You must. And I went back to the camp many years ago when I was in America. Did I dream this? It must have been uh, a dream. I want to see the place. I went there. The Russians were still there. So Terezin was 60 kilometers north of Prague. Next. And I went to see the first time in Europe. Uh, also, I went to Israel first to see that country. And then I made my way back to Europe. Wait, not so fast. Go back, please. One back. Can you go back? OK, go next. 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 And, and then a bus came. I, I told you about that. The bus came to pick us up, to bring us back to Stuttgart. And I was the only child from the state of uh, Württemberg, from all the transports, the only child who came back, the only one. I was 10 years old at that time. Next. 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 So, next. So I went through the gate in 1966, first time back. Next. Next. And I went to the house where we lived, the real slum area was still rats crawling around. I've been there quite a few times since then with groups. I'm going again this summer. And the uh, uh, buildings have been renewed. People are living there again. I mean, the whole place was a slum. They are rejuvenating it. Next. Here's uh, the train street. From here, the trains went straight to Auschwitz. The tracks were built. Next. In front of the crematory with the mayor. It's, uh, it's a very big memorial. They have two parts to it, the small fortress and the big one. One was a prison for the prison. Next. And the crematory ovens, which are considered the best preserved crematory ovens in all of the camps in Europe. Many uh, distinguished people come to see it, many students. Next. And um, uh, red flowers depicting blood for the memorial. Next. And I went to see the farmers in my mother's hometown who helped us in the time of need. They brought some food when it was, you know, they could have gotten killed for that. They were not the bystander, the upstanders. Next. And this picture is the most important of all of my talk. It's my second hero, Teresa, who was my grandmother's maid for 30 for 25 years. She was not only her maid, but her best, her good friend. And when we came back, we said, we want to see Teresa. Teresa came in the middle of the night to save two photo albums. That's why you see pictures here. Our prayer books, some little knickknacks, religious knickknacks. And she would bring us food when it was very dangerous. She would put it behind the uh, cemetery uh, my grandfather's stone, and we would pick it up in the morning. He said, we're going to her. I said, no, you can't. She's no longer alive. He said, what happened? When the Americans came to that part of Germany, you know, they were yelling, and they thought everybody was hiding ammunition. And she didn't open the door right away and stood behind the front door. And the soldier shot through the door, instantly killing her. And Today, there are two women in heaven, hand in hand. One killed by a Nazi bullet. My grandmother was sent to Riga, where they were sent to the forest and killed. I went to that place. I saw it. At least 52 mass graves, between 50,000, maybe even 80,000, in that one forest alone. And for all intents and purposes, I should have been in one of those mass graves. I, to me, that was one of the worst days of my life. I took a candle along that time to have a memorial there, and I um, 
I put um, my book cover of the German version because I thought she couldn't understand the English and I wrote to her, dearest granny, I shall never forget you. It was devastating. So she was killed by a Nazi bullet and she the product of war and a Christian Jew forever united. I, this is my second hero. I am still very good friends with her great-grandchildren. They have come to visit me in New York. Uh, also, <clears throat> her grandson. I have one more thing I want to show you. Next, please. Some years ago, <clears throat> I've always been searching for a picture, anything about my best friend, Ruth. And I put it in papers. And then finally, after searching uh, near and far, I said, let me go to the internet. And I went to a German newspaper online, the Tagesspiegel in Berlin. She lived in Berlin. And I said, I am looking for Ruth Abraham, a picture. Anybody uh, have a picture? Because she had Christian relatives. I mean, she had a Christian grandmother, so somebody should still be alive. Lo and behold, two people answered me very quickly. One was a reporter. He wanted to do a story. Well, he was hopeless for me. He just wanted to write a story. But the other one was a genealogist, and she searched already. She found some relatives and one had a picture of her. This picture, it is not a, in good shape. She was maybe four years old. That is all that is left of that little girl. And when I was writing my book, I was sitting at my kitchen table and I thought, how did she feel as she walked with her mother into the gas chamber? Because the women took the children and the men went separate. And I wrote a poem about that, which I want to read to you now. It is called Hold Me Tight, about hope until the very end. Come with me, my child. Hold my hand. Be calm, my child. Do not try to understand. Don't be afraid, my child. Walk with pride. You know your mother is here at your side. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. There's still hope to give this child, an eight-year-old child. She might, actually she was almost 10, excuse me, it was like nine and a, or close before her 10th birthday. She went there when she was seven, also like me. No, no, don't look at the chimney. See the blue sky. My arm is around to protect you. Don't cry. Come close. Let the blows fall on me. There'll be a day when again we'll be free. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. Eternal hope. Give all your belongings to them. Quickly undress. One day soon we will again have happiness. Sleep, my child. I have no more to give. Oh, God! Oh, God! We're not going to live. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Hold me tight.